One Piece is one of the greatest stories ever told. With a lovable cast of characters, some of the most expansive world building ever seen, and a narrative filled with so many powerful and satisfying moments that have been built up over the course of years. Or at least, that's what I was always told. Because until recently, I had never really delved into One Piece. The manga started in 1997, and is still releasing issues to this day, with the series about to close in on 1100 chapters. Its anime adaptation currently has 1,075 episodes, and sitting at 20 minutes apiece, getting up to date with the series would take a significant time investment. As a newcomer to the series, seeing the sheer scale of it is incredibly intimidating, and has scared me off from ever starting it. And had it not been for the Netflix live action adaptation, I might have never started my adventure with Luffy and the Straw Hat crew. With an 8 episode first season, it felt like the perfect way for me to jump aboard and experience the story in its newest adaptation. Now I had a healthy dose of skepticism heading into the show, as my previous experiences with Netflix live action anime adaptations were... Not good to say the least. But I thought the trailers looked pretty promising, so I was excited to finally watch the show. I'm happy to say that I really ended up enjoying the show, and my interest in the series is at an all-time high. I don't think it was a perfect season of television by any means, but I was having fun almost the entire time. I think the show was an immense success that allowed a new demographic of people who had never read the manga or watched the anime to experience the story of One Piece. Over the course of this video, I will be discussing the show in detail, talking about its successes and failures. Spoiler warning for the first season of the One Piece live action. All of us are super honored to be your straw hats and be a part of this amazing story. Before getting into the meat of the story content, I felt like it was important to highlight some of the behind the scenes elements that helped bring the story to life. A lot of IPs have been said to be unadaptable. Some of these stories were deemed unadaptable because they were too weird and zany, others because the world was too big and the story too long. One Piece was number one on this list with a bullet, as it checks just about every box that would make adapting it to live action a massive challenge. They were like, they were gonna do a live action of One Piece, I was like, how? But I think the production team did a great job tailoring the material to the live action medium. A lot of the time, anime can be incredibly over the top, and while you can get away with this in animation, it can turn into turbo cringe if adapted one for one into the real world. Just look at Cowboy Bebop. I think the showrunner succeeded in keeping the high energy nature of the source material without crossing the line into cringe. Looking at some of the interviews from the showrunners and cast, it was clear how much effort the team put into bringing this story to life. They worked alongside series creator Ichiro Oda, collaborating throughout the whole production. They were also committed to using as many practical effects and sets as possible, giving the show a level of authenticity. These sets look great on camera, and show how the team were doing their very best to make this world feel real. They also added nice touches like having the original voice actors for the anime do the Japanese dub for the live action. It's the little things like these that show that they are paying respect to the original material and the iterations that came before. This is one of the most likable casts that I have seen in a while. Everyone seems to love being a part of the show, and are giving their absolute everything to make it a success. The cast did a lot of their own stunts, dedicating themselves and putting their body on the line to make the show the best experience possible. Sanji's actor, Taz Skyler, went above and beyond, training relentlessly to get his kicks to an incredibly high standard, and he even trained as a chef to make his portrayal more faithful to the character. By watching a few of these behind the scenes videos with the cast, you can see how much all this means to them, from getting emotional reliving scenes, to getting Oda's blessing. You can really see how much this experience has meant to the entire cast, and I feel like it's impossible not to be rooting for them. I'm setting out to follow my dream, to find the One Piece, and become King of the Pirates! The show opens in a place called Logetown, 22 years before the start of our main story. We see that a massive crowd has formed, all to witness the execution of Gold Roger, who is not only the most notorious pirate to have ever lived, but even claims the title of King of the Pirates. Despite this being the stage of his execution, Roger seems pretty chill about the whole thing, almost giddy. A vice admiral, who we later learn to be Garp, asks Roger if he has any final words. Big mistake. 
Turns out, Roger's final words will have lasting consequences as he does his best Mr. Beast impression. On my island is buried a treasure chest. Good luck finding it. Telling the gathered masses that somewhere on the Grand Line, he buried his treasure, the One Piece. Now Garp really goofed here, because as soon as he heard Roger start talking, he should have given the nod for the executioners to stop him. Instead, Roger's words usher in a new age of piracy, as the crowd disperses all with the same goal in mind, finding the One Piece. Roger dies with a laugh on his lips as he witnesses the chaos of the crowd, knowing that they will continue his legacy. I think this opening scene does a great job to pique the viewer's interest as the world feels immediately compelling. Free yourselves! Take to the seas! My treasure! It's yours to find. We are then introduced to our main character, Monkey D. Luffy. I wonder what the D stands for. Davy, Daniel, Dante, Dabloon? I guess that's a mystery we will just have to learn in future seasons. As we meet Luffy himself, he is on a little dinghy that's taking in water as he tells the audience, I mean, the bird, about his dreams. I think what this scene does well is to help establish the kind of tone that One Piece is going for. So what do you say? Are you with me? Mutiny. Luffy instantly comes across as a fun, kooky character, and it feels like the show will mirror him in a lot of ways. I think after this scene, the audience can expect a fun, goofy pirate adventure, and that's what they get. I like this as our first introduction to the character, as it gives him all the room in the world to grow and rise in status. As his boat sinks, we learn that Luffy can't swim. We later learn that the reason for this is because he ate a devil fruit, which gave him special abilities but at the cost of being cursed by the sea. I think the inability to swim for a pirate makes their relationship to the sea more interesting as it feels like a juxtaposition. When you think of a pirate, you just kind of assume that they can swim, and so the fact that anyone who eats a devil fruit can't adds a new element to the story. We learn that Luffy isn't ready to go down with his ship though as he climbs into a barrel, flashing me back to a game from my childhood called Monkeys in a Barrel. As Luffy floats on, he winds up in the middle of a skirmish. We see this massive pink heart ship led by a pirate named Alvida. When her crew defeats the other vessel, she lines up the survivors, asking them if they transported a pirate hunter named Roranoa Zoro. When Alvida asks if she was number one on Zoro's list, they say, who? This causes her to pull a Negan, using her spiky duck bat to bash in the man's head. A pink-haired boy and member of Alvida's crew, Kobe, is put in charge of washing the brain splatter off the deck. Later, when Kobe is cleaning Alvida's bat, Luffy bursts out of one of the barrels. I guess during the battle, they saw a floating barrel and assumed it was loot from the other ship. While looking for food, Luffy tells Kobe he is a pirate, and the two start talking about what makes a pirate. Having Alvida as his main experience with pirates, Kobe denounces them as cruel, thieving murderers. Pirates are scum. They're thieves and murderers. Whereas Luffy has had a much different experience with pirates. To him, being a pirate is the best thing ever, because it means freedom, adventure, and the friendship of a crew. I think this idea of what it means to be a pirate is an interesting discussion brought up a couple times over the season. It's also pretty evident from the start that Luffy is a different kind of pirate from the norm. Fearing what Alvita might do if she found Luffy aboard her ship, Kobe and Luffy try to sneak him onto a dinghy. However, despite what Luffy might claim, I'm stealthy. He is terrible at sneaking. He accidentally wakes up Alvida and her entire crew. Luffy then starts telling Alvida about everything that Kobe said about her during his vent session. Luffy even goes far as to embellish what Kobe said, saying that Kobe called her, and that you're as dumb as a sea cow. No, Captain Alvida, I didn't. Which is not something that he said. We then get our first glimpse at Luffy, the rubber boy, as he fights Alvida. I think making Luffy's abilities look somewhat believable and getting the audience to buy into it was one of the show's toughest challenges. From a VFX standpoint, you know, we we went through many different look devs on how do we make his arm work? How do we make his body work so that it's a power, but it feels like it could be a real power. I think on first watch, some of this early CGI looks a little jarring, but as the show goes on, I feel the audience adapts to it. Also, Luffy seems completely invulnerable as he is bulletproof and can take a spike bat to the skull. I think this fight continues to reinforce this fun, silly tone that is associated with the show. As you watch this rubber boy bouncing around, it's pretty clear that this isn't the most serious show in the world. After knocking out Alvida, Luffy and Kobe 
Kobe take their leave and start heading to the nearest island. As Luffy and Kobe are sailing, we cut to another one of our main characters, Zoro, the pirate hunter who was mentioned earlier. On first glance, this guy cuts a striking figure with his green hair and count him three swords. He is approached by some guy called Mr. Seven, who kind of looks like one of the Lost Boys from the movie Hook. Mr. Seven wants Zoro to join his mercenary crew, but Zoro isn't really interested and decides to flip him off. Mr. Seven doesn't really want to take no for an answer, and so the two fight. I have to say that throughout the season, I consistently found Zoro's fights to be the most entertaining. I think it has a lot to do with his fighting style, dual wielding swords, which is a lot easier to wrap your head around than the Rubber Boy. I also thought it was really cool how in this fight, Zoro was blocking Mr. Seven's attacks by only half unsheathing his sword. It showed that Zoro wasn't taking him all that seriously, as well as just being a cool visual. Eventually, Zoro has enough and does the double slash through of Mr. Seven. Introducing our third major character of the episode, we cut to a girl who has seemingly been stranded at sea after having had a run-in with pirates. She sees an approaching ship and asks for their help only for them to see her chest, <clears throat> her treasure chest, and attempt to rob her. But when they open it, they find nothing. And when they look back, their own ship is sailing away, with the girl now lively as ever, waving them off. Classic pirate maneuver, the old get them to jump onto the worst ship and then jump on and steal their better ship. That's got to be the best pirate I've ever seen. So it would seem. Hey boys, thanks for the rescue. Also, she hasn't been named yet, but this girl is Nami. Our three groups all converge at a bar in Shellstown. Luffy and Kobe are talking about how they're going to break into the Marine base so they can get a map of the Grand Line. They mention that the Marine leader, Captain Morgan, Captain Morgan, to life, love, and loot is a tough cookie and likely has the map under guard. As they are discussing this, we see Zoro trying to get a drink at the bar, his baggie full of Mr. Seven with him. A little girl tries to give Zoro some food that she made, only for her to be knocked over, which causes her to drop the food on the floor. The person who bumped into her is a real Malfoy type, with the hair of Lucius and with the attitude of Draco. Turns out he is Captain Morgan's son, and as a result, he is all, oh, my father will hear about this. He does raise one good point though. Come on, tough guy, three swords? <laughs> What is that third sword for? Zoro doesn't take kindly to this, as he eats the squashed food off the floor. And then he orders the Malfoy boy, whose real name is Helmeppo, What kind of stupid name is that? to apologize. Helmeppo then draws his sword, ready to fight Zoro, who beats his ass without even trying. It's a really cool sequence, and shows how much stronger Zoro is than the average marine. As Helmeppo is begging for his life, he mentions his father is a marine captain, and Zoro decides to pay him a little visit, so that he can collect the bounty on Mr. Seven. While this was going on, Nami was also in the bar. She is approached by a marine asking if he can buy her a drink. To the delight of short kings everywhere, she rejects him Too tall. and instead pursues a short king. Even though she is schmoozing him at first, once the chaos of Zoro's fight breaks out, she smashes the short king's head and drags him off. Turns out she was only using him to steal his uniform. Pour one out for our boy. There is an interesting conversation between Luffy and Kobe after they witnessed what went down between Zoro and the marines. Up until that moment, Kobe's view of the world had been pretty black and white. Pirates equal bad and marines equal good. But after seen the marines abusing their power, he has to grapple with the way that he sees the world. He had to protect that little girl from the marines. Who was supposed to be protecting her. It was his dream to become a marine because to him they were a symbol of justice that uplifted the people. He has to come to terms with the realities of the world where it is not so black and white. We finally get to meet the famous Captain Morgan as Zoro tries to claim his bounty. I was not expecting Captain Morgan to be wearing zebra print pants. He was wearing zebra pants. Morgan tells Zoro that he will get his bounty but because he struck a marine he has to serve seven days strung up in the yard and if he refuses to comply all of the other marine bases will will be notified not to pay Zoro for future bounties. Zoro decides to turn himself in and spend the seven days in the yard. This moment was a little weird for me because where I understand Zoro's decision, it makes him come off as kind of naive to think that Helmeppo and Morgan will let him just walk away after he does his time. You think my father's gonna let you go? You are going to die. 
in this yard. It also seems like he regrets his choice pretty quickly after Helmeppo taunts him and takes his sword, seemingly not even lasting a day before he wants to escape. So yeah, this seemed like an instance of the show needing to get Zaro in a certain place and the execution in getting him there being just a little muddy. We see that Luffy and Nami both have the same objective, get the map to the Grand Line from Morgan's office. The different ways in which they each go about achieving that goal shows a lot about who they are as characters. Luffy is a stumbling force of nature, determined to get what he wants but not bothered by the particulars of the how. He climbs through the drainage system and pops out into the yard, where Zoro is being held. He is unbothered by this detour, using it to take the time to talk to Zoro. He compliments Zoro's skills and asks if he wants to join his crew, all while announcing that he is going to be the Pirate King. Luffy's energy is so infectious that he gets Zoro to think of a time before he became a pirate hunter and to reflect on what his real dream is. I made a promise to someone to become the world's greatest swordsman. Zoro tells Luffy that his dream is to be the greatest swordsman in the world, which impresses Luffy as he unties Zoro. But Luffy still has a job to do, so it's back into the drains for him. Where Luffy is flying by the seat of his pants, Nami has a plan. She has donned the Short King's uniform and blended in with the Marines. She makes her way to the documents room, searching for the map. When questioned about who she is and what she is doing there, she is quick to lie, using her charisma to sell the deception. Even though the Marine buys Nami's story, Short King is clocking into work for the day and recognizes her. Forced to adapt, Nami breaks out her bow staff and beats up Short King and company. Just then, Luffy falls from the ceiling and having heard that Nami isn't actually a marine, he realizes that they are looking for the same thing. As they make their way through the base to try and find Morgan's office, we learn more about Nami. When Luffy announces himself as a pirate and asks Nami to join his crew, Nami becomes immediately hostile, telling him that she hates pirates. I hate pirates, hate them. But even if that's the case, the two to partner up as a means to get the map. Nami is insistent that they need a plan, while Luffy is happy to just walk around in the open. When they come across Morgan, Nami is quick to lie once again, claiming Luffy to be her prisoner and feeding Morgan's ego when he starts to question her. We also get to see that Nami has sticky fingers, having stolen Morgan's keys without him realizing. I feel like this scene gives us some good characterization for Nami, showing the role that she will have in the crew. Her bread and butter are lying and stealing, and she puts them to use whenever she can. They break into Morgan's office, and and while Nami is trying to crack the safe, Morgan finds the Short King and realizes his keys are missing, sounding the alarm. <laughs> Unable to crack the safe in time, the pair switch to Luffy's approach, which involves him ripping the safe out of the ground and flying out of the tower's window. I wasn't a huge fan of them walking away from such a massive fall unscathed. It made them feel fully invulnerable and lessened the stakes a bit. I can understand how Luffy would be unscathed, as he is practically a demigod, but it seems a little less believable in the case of Nami. Her being perfectly okay really felt like anime logic and took me out of it a bit. The art is swarmed by marines, forcing Luffy and Nami to fight them off as best they can. It's fun seeing them in action, and the cast's dedication to their stunt work is on full display here. Zoro is about to peace out when he sees Luffy and Nami start to struggle against the marines. He makes the decision to help them out, power sliding into the battle. His decision to stay and help comes back to his conversation with Luffy. He sees Luffy so doggedly striving for his dream and can't help but admire it. Also, he never actually served his seven days in the yard, so his time as a bounty hunter is already at an end. As Captain Morgan himself enters the fray, Zoro knows he needs to go into tryhard mode. He's kind of like Ash from Pokemon. Whenever Ash would turn his hat backwards, you knew that he meant business. Similarly, whenever Zoro puts on his bandana, you know things just got serious. We finally get to learn what the third sword is for, and turns out he holds it in his mouth. So that's where it goes. This looks equally cool as it does silly, and even though the mouth sword has no real practicality to it, I mean seriously, you can't cut shit like that. I understand that it is no doubt iconic to Zoro's fighting style. With Luffy and Zoro combining forces, they are ultimately able to defeat Captain Morgan and leave with the safe. Also Bendy Sword. They flee to Nami's boat where we continue to get some fun character moments. I'm sensing a little bit of tension amongst the crew. Not, Not a crew. crew. In a lot of ways, Luffy feels like a kid who is doing a pirate role play and is trying to get others to play with him. They are nearly stopped by Helmeppo, who is sporting a new haircut after an encounter with Zoro, until Kobe comes from behind and knocks him out. Kobe 
decide to stay behind and join the Marines, as Luffy and crew sail away. Perhaps the biggest revelation of the entire episode comes near the end though, as we are reintroduced to Garp, who is talking on a snail phone. What is up with these snail phones? They seem so strange to me. How do they work as telephones, and why do they have such luscious lips? Are these living creatures that have been subjected to a life of servitude? Or did the person who invented telephones have a thing for snails? Garp's snail has a mustache. Does it need to shave? Honestly, these snail phones beg so many questions, and I am going to keep my eye out for the rest of the show. There are flashbacks integrated alongside the present day storyline of the show, highlighting a certain character's backstory during a given episode. The intention of them is to give further depth to the characters and to help the audience understand their decisions and actions in the main storyline. I think when the flashbacks are at their best, they further inform and develop the character as well as their relationships. It also serves to emphasize and add impact to the main narrative. The first flashback we get to experience is with Luffy, which helps to inform us where he gets his love of pirates from. Young Luffy spends a lot of his time around a pirate named Shanks, who he grows to idolize. He looks to Shanks and his crew, and sees not only the freedom that they get to experience, but the bond that they have built amongst themselves. This is appealing to Luffy, as he has his grandpa trying to force him down the path of the Marines, taking away Luffy's ability to choose his own dreams. We learn pretty quick that Luffy is a little bit nuts, stabbing himself in the face so that Shanks will bring him aboard when they next set sail. Not only does Luffy have terrible aim, at least you didn't get your eye. I was aiming for it, but I missed. But he wants the mark to scar, so that he looks more like a pirate. As Shanks and his crew are drinking at a local bar, a different pirate crew shows up looking to partake in some drinking of their own. However, as they are trying to come to grips with the pirate's greatest dilemma, Why is the rum always gone? The new pirates clown on Shanks, breaking a bottle and mocking him when he goes to clean it up. Having seen this, Luffy is big mad, thinking that Shanks should have fought back. As the pirate altercation was going down, Luffy found himself a devil fruit, which looks more like a weird hybrid between a piece of cake and a gummy candy than it does an actual fruit. As he tries to storm off, Shanks grabs his arm, causing it to stretch like a piece of half-chewed bubblegum. Turns out, when someone eats a devil fruit, they gain a special ability. In Luffy's case, the ability to stretch, as his body has become rubber. The drawback is that they are cursed by the sea and can no longer swim. I think the idea of a devil fruit is pretty interesting and has the potential to create a lot of kooky characters. The rum pirate comes back and Luffy starts talking mad trash to him, causing Rummy to threaten him. This is when Shanks steps in and unlike the first time where he is all laughs, not really caring about what the other pirate did, this time he is not going to let his friend get hurt. You can spill a drink on me and I'll let it slide, but don't you ever threaten my friends. I think this is an important lesson for Luffy, as just because you can fight somebody doesn't mean you always should. The first altercation didn't matter because nothing was really at stake, and so Shanks defused the situation without violence. But when it has escalated to a point where his friend's life is in danger, Shanks stands up and fights. This is something that Luffy takes with him when he starts off on his own journey. The rum pirate tries to flee with Luffy as his hostage, going into the sea on a little dinghy. But as a massive sea monster shows up and knocks the pair into the water, Luffy is destined to drown before his journey is ever allowed to begin. But Shanks manages to come to his rescue and pull him back onto the boat. Shanks gets into a staring contest with the sea monster before he tells it to buzz off. This scene made me think that Shanks has some sort of power that we aren't yet aware of, as it almost seemed like he commanded the sea monster or something. I think there is very clearly more to this and will no doubt be explored more in future seasons, which is exciting as I found Shanks pretty interesting in his brief stint in the first season. Also, apparently at some point he lost his arm. When I first saw this, I was completely confused as I didn't see when it even happened and especially because Shanks gives absolutely no reaction to losing it. Like seriously, my man lost an arm and didn't mutter so much as an ouch. It is but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? Worse. After they return to shore, Shanks and his crew get ready to head out, but Luffy has realized that maybe he's not ready to be a pirate. He's still resolute though, vowing to follow his dreams and become the greatest pirate ever, one day. In a sweet moment, Shanks gives him his straw hat, and makes a promise that when they meet again, Luffy will give him back his hat. It's a really nice moment that caps off Luffy's backstory. Well, that's my map. <laughs> I'm gonna get it back. <laughs> no matter who I have to kill. No longer pressed for time, Nami manages to crack open the safe, 
securing the map to the Grand Line. However, there is no time to celebrate, as some red knockout gas envelops them and does as advertised. Before he drops cold, Luffy thinks quickly and eats the map. When they come to, they learn that they have been captured by pirates, and we are introduced to one of the best characters of the entire show, Buggy the Clown. Every second Buggy is on screen, he is an absolute delight. He has enslaved the local town, and as a result, has them as his captive audience. It was a ton of fun with his henchmen holding up a laugh or applause sign whenever Buggy called for it. It kind of gave me please clap vibes. Please clap. Also, even though the jokes about the audience doing the opposite of what Buggy wanted were pretty predictable, that did not rob them of any of their enjoyment. You don't make me laugh. <laughs> I said don't make me laugh! When Luffy unwittingly utters the word nose, Buggy loses it. I will say though, the fact that Buggy is so sensitive about his clown nose makes me think that the big red ball is his actual nose, and that he was just born with some sort of massive growth on his nose. It's almost like he had no choice in choosing the clown motif. Being born with a big red nose, you have two options, become a clown or one of Santa's reindeer. Buggy ended up walking the path of the clown, but he started on that journey a sad clown. There's also a great moment where Buggy says, Here end the theatrics. Only for a very theatrical spotlight zoom. Truly great stuff. One moment that was a little bit off though, was when Nami tried to escape, and Buggy's henchman just kind of let her. Oh, she's making a run for it. Is anyone gonna try and stop her? No? Okay, cool. The only reason they even catch her is because she collapses after seeing what Buggy did to the town. I think it's interesting to show that at the start of the episode, Nami is not ready to go down with the ship, so to speak, and is still looking out for herself first. But the way it was done was kind of sloppy. The reason Buggy he has trapped the Straw Hats is because he has been informed that they have the map to the Grand Line, and he wants it for himself. Having overheard Luffy tell the others that he has the map in a safe place, he sends Nami and Zoro into another room, so that he can have a private convo with Luffy. He tries to get Luffy to talk by stretching him a la Armstrong. Stretch Armstrong, your stretchable superhero! Stretch him four times his size! But nothing is giving, so he takes a different approach, psychoanalyzing Luffy in order to try and understand him. He recognizes Luffy's hat, and we learn that Buggy and Shanks are former crewmates. Buggy mentions that Shanks betrayed him, and all I'm saying is, where's the Buggy flashback at though? That sounds interesting, and I'd be curious to see what actually went down. I feel like in future seasons we'll find out what happened, and we'll definitely see the two characters interact. With Luffy still not giving in, Buggy Buggy turns into Jigsaw, trapping Luffy in a box where he will slowly be drowned by seawater. Just when it seems like Luffy is done for, Nami and Zoro, who escaped their imprisonment thanks to a well-hidden lockpick, burst in and free Luffy. Unfortunately, Luffy swallowed so much seawater that he hacked up the map. Luffy and Zoro attack a buggy, but no matter how many times they chop him, his body always reattaches itself. It turns out, Buggy ate a devil fruit as well, the Chop Chop Fruit. He is able to detach his body parts, sending them to attack the Straw Hats, almost like a tornado. Buggy's powers are pretty ridiculous, but the show manages to make it work in its universe. I also think the visual effects concerning his abilities look pretty good, even if he looks like he is made out of some type of putty. Luffy comes up with the idea of trapping Buggy's individual body parts thus weakening him. As the Straw Hats trap Buggy's extremities, I can't help but feel like Buggy's powers are more of a curse than a boon. If the Straw Hats took those boxes with them or separated them all across the world, Bucky would be stuck as little more than a head. The image of little Buggy is pretty funny though, as he begs for Luffy's mercy before being launched into the air. With Buggy defeated, Zoro is ready to leave, completely forgetting about the townsfolk who are still chained up. After the leave, we also get a nice moment as Nami fixes Luffy's hat which was damaged in the fight. However, there's still some mystery surrounding Nami as she goes to use her Bluetooth snail. And while the audience is left to wonder about who it is Nami is talking to and what her hidden agenda really is, I am left thinking, the snail phones come in Bluetooth models? While this is all going on, we get a subplot centered on Kobe and the Marines. It doesn't get off to the best start in my opinion as Kobe decided to stay in Shellstown and join the Marine Corps at that base. Bit of a risky move on his part if you ask me, considering that he punched out Helmeppo and helped the Straw Hats escape. 
is really banking on the fact that Helmeppo didn't see who knocked him out. Feels a little short-sighted by Kobe and weak in the writing department. Garp also arrives at the base, with his fursona on full display. We find out that in the aftermath of the Straw Hat's escape, a massive injustice has been committed, and that is that the Short King seems to have taken the fall for Captain Morgan, as he is chained in the yard. Garp is rightly suspicious of Kobe and calls him into his office for questioning. As the scene starts, we see Garp feeding his snail phone lettuce, which in my mind confirms that they are living creatures that have been enslaved by humanity to conduct phone surveys. If I'm being honest, I don't really have much to say about the marine storyline throughout the season. To me, it was oftentimes the least engaging material of the show. I think this is in large part because its cast of characters are not nearly as interesting or charismatic as the Straw Hats are. Also, where the Straw Hats are hopping from adventure to adventure, the Marines are very singular in focus and don't include much room for fun antics. I understand why it was included in the season as it helps to juxtapose the Straw Hats as well as giving some stakes as they are in constant pursuit. And having that Marine pursuit be present and on the Straw Hats and on Luffy's tail almost from the get-go, from episode two. Um, it was a big change, and I thought it was something that we really needed in order to keep the stakes up. The Marine stuff wasn't bad or anything. In fact, it has a few good moments like Kobe learning about some of the corruption amongst the Marines when it comes to pardoning the Seven Warlords, and Garp having a little arc about letting Luffy grow and allowing the next generation to take over. But even still, whenever we were with the Marines, I would have almost always preferred to be following the Straw Hats instead. Overall, the Marine stuff is fine, but I probably won't talk about it much more in this video, except when it intersects with the main storyline. Pirates! The pirates are coming! They're attacking the village! Pirates! Pirates! Of the many little arcs of the season, the Syrup Village arc is probably my least favorite. I felt like a lot of the character beats, especially with Usopp, were undercooked, and some of the more ridiculous elements crossed over from fun silly to silly silly. We start by following our Straw Hat crew on the open waters, where Zoro tells Nami that he broke the toilet, only for it to be revealed that there was no toilet on the ship. Nami, I think the toilet's busted. We don't have a toilet. So, was Zoro pissing and shitting in Nami's secret stash, or what? There's no time to dwell on that though, because the ship is taking in water, and they head to Syrup Village in the hopes of getting a new one. As they arrive in town and start scouting potential ships, Nami begins to scope out the security, as she plans on stealing a ship. Luffy is opposed to this though, saying that they can't just steal a ship as it is meant to be part of their crew. I think this once again highlights the differences between these two characters. Luffy is all endless enthusiasm and is perpetually optimistic that things will just fall into place. I think it speaks to his naivety, as well as him almost being a force of nature, making things happen from sheer insistence. Nami on the other hand seems to have had much more experience, as well as having lived a more difficult life. For Nami, things don't just fall into place for her. She lives in in the real world, and the real world is cruel and unrelenting, driving people to do things they never thought that they would. She doesn't want to steal a ship, but if they are to continue on their journey, she has to do something about it, instead of just hoping that the universe will gift it to her. I think Luffy refusing to steal also further challenges her perception of a pirate. In her experience, pirates take anything and everything they want, regardless of what it means for the people left in their wake. By Luffy rejecting this idea of stealing, I think she still does not view him as as a pirate, but as she puts it, You're not a pirate. Yes, I am. No, you are just some stretchy guy in a tattered hat. While walking the shipyard, Luffy comes across the perfect ship, fully decked out with a sheep's head on the bow. As Luffy is admiring the boat, its caretaker, Usopp, pops up, excited to talk about it. Although the Straw Hats initially thought Usopp owned the boat, it turns out it is owned by his friend, and he is just the local barnacle boy, making sure it stays clean. We see that seemingly every day for years, Usopp has sounded the town's alarm bells, warning that pirates have landed. He is the boy that cried pirates. Wanting to impress the Straw Hats, Usopp brings them to his friend's house, which is a mansion. However, he is seemingly not welcomed by the house's attendants, with only the lady of the manor, his friend Kaya, welcoming his presence. Kaya convinces her butler, who I'm going to call Kiro, to allow Usopp and his new friends to stay for dinner. Usopp gets some alone time with Kaya, where he tells her all kinds of far-fetched stories about his adventures. He is a massive liar, and a bit of a Pinocchio, and after seeing his original character design in the manga, it checks out. 
We also learn a little bit about Kaya in this scene. Her parents died, and she is set to fully inherit the entirety of her parents' fortune when she celebrates her 18th birthday, which just so happens to be the next day. She also has some mysterious illness that can only be cured by drinking Baja Blast. As everyone is preparing for the dinner party, we get some character interactions. Zoro thinks he recognizes Kiro, but the butler denies this. Nami meets Kaya's family accountant, who is a sheep man. Side note, sheep man exist in this universe. Once dinner starts, Kaya is served some sort of blue sludge. Using any excuse not to eat it, she engages in conversation with Luffy, and asks what the Straw Hats are doing in Syrup Village. As always, Luffy proudly declares himself as a pirate. He displays poor dinner etiquette by walking on the table, and asks Kaya to give him a free ship. Naturally, this causes some issues for Kuro, and the dinner is cut short. After dinner, no one can sleep, and so while Luffy, Zoro, and Usopp go to hang out in the kitchen, Nami starts robbing the place. Hearing someone, and fearing getting caught, Nami darts into the nearest room. This turns out to be Kaya's room, who also happens to be awake, catching Nami red-handed. It's a pretty weird exchange though, as Kaya is actually pretty chill about her thievery, only for Nami to get mad at Kaya for giving her pity. To be honest, I find some of the decor to be a bit gaudy. I prefer to donate it to charity. I'm not charity. It's like Nami, look where you are. You were stealing from her, and yet you're the one getting angry. I just thought this was kind of funny. While hanging out, we learn that Usopp's dad is a pirate and a member of Shanks' crew, which doesn't have any major relevance, but is neat nonetheless. Luffy decides to eat some of the blue soup goo, while Zoro and Usopp go searching for some wine in the cellar. Up to this point, I don't really have any major issues with the storyline. However, that changes pretty quick. A little bit before Zoro and Usopp enter the cellar, Kuro and Mary we're having a conversation there about Kaya's inheritance. Kuro is insisting to Mary that Kaya wants to transfer everything to him, and when Mary doubts him and wants to talk with Kaya about it, Kuro slices him up, revealing himself to be an undercover pirate, trying to steal Kaya's fortune. Kuro's plan is really stupid, and I think he's probably the worst antagonist in the show. After faking his own death and serving as Kaya's butler for three years, his plan is to have Kaya transfer her fortune over to him, and then kill her on the very night she gets her inheritance. Now, I'm no marine, but that's what we call in the biz, mighty fishy. Like, doesn't he think some people might go asking questions about Kaya's death, when she is killed immediately after transferring all of her assets to her butler? You've already waited three years, why not wait a little longer so it's not so sus? Also, why not convince Kaya to name you her heir, something she might agree to, instead of making her transfer all her assets to you behind her back? When Kuro kills Mary, it doesn't even sound like the transfer has been made or is official yet. Well, these are our wishes, Mary. Then she can tell me herself. That young woman has been through enough, and I won't let anyone take advantage of her. And killing the accountant just makes it even more suspicious. Things get dumber when after killing Mary, Kuro makes no effort to get rid of the body. Instead he just chills in the cellar for some reason, waiting for Usopp and Zoro to stumble on the corpse. Zoro gets bonked on the head and is knocked out, while Kuro lets Usopp escape because he knows Usopp has already destroyed his credibility with the village. Kuro then sends his underlings to get rid of the bodies, as Mary and Zoro are thrown into the well. I'm not sure what it is about this show and characters surviving massive falls, but Zoro should be dead after being tossed down the well, or at the very least have a ton of broken bones. But when he wakes up and is just fine, it really took a lot of suspension of disbelief on my part. I can buy into snail phones, rubber boy powers, and all other sorts of shenanigans, but it's hard to buy into something like this where a supposedly normal person is put in a situation where they should very clearly be dead or injured. The payoff of Zoro climbing out of the well isn't even worth it, as I find his climb to be pretty boring and a chore to get through, as opposed to a triumphant moment which I think was their intention. Why won't anybody believe me? Pirates! The pirates are coming! I wonder why. When no one will believe him, Usopp finds help from the marines in Kobe and Helmeppo. He brings them to Kaya's manor, only to be rebuffed by Kiro, who takes the opportunity to give the marines Luffy, who passed out from eating the poisoned soup. Feeling desperate, Usopp runs from the situation and goes to Kaya's room. He tells her about everything, but she doesn't believe him, thinking it's another one of his imaginative tales. Only this one isn't any fun, and in what is one of Usopp's best moments of the season, he decides not to run away, and instead plants himself in Kaya's room, refusing to leave until he knows that she is safe. It shows how much he cares about her, and that he is willing to stand by his friends when times get tough. I'm not leaving your side. Not until I know you're safe. 
I would have liked to see more of this from his character, as even though this is a great moment, it feels like they should have built upon this a bit more. As the clock strikes midnight, it's killing time, and with the jig up, the personas come out. Kuro's cronies put the manor on lockdown, using a private defense system to trap Kaya in the house. This is where we get peak Kuro cringe, as he makes his way to Kaya's room to kill her. It's just you and me, Miss Kaya. It's time. To wake up! He's just so extra, having this big monologue as he is scraping his claws along the walls. I think it's meant to come off as creepy, but it really didn't land for me. As Kiro hunts down Kaya, we get to see Luffy yarf all over Helmeppo. He slimed me. It's a bit of a sloppy scene because apparently, when Luffy was passed out unconscious, he was still able to hear Kiro talking because otherwise, he should have no idea that Kiro is a secret pirate and wants to kill Kaya. Also, Zoro runs into them and says he was just just heading back to the house. Except, when they actually leave to go back to the house, he goes in the direction he just came from. I guess these things don't really matter that much in the grand scheme, but they are less than ideal. The anti-pirate security system isn't really worth much, because Zoro and Luffy just kind of lift it up and walk in. As Nami joins Usopp and Kaya in trying to evade Kuro, we get to see how a lot of her interactions with Kaya translate to her own situation and experiences. When Kaya is upset, talking about how disappointed her parents would be of her for being used and taken advantage of by a pirate, Nami tries to reassure her that they would be happy as long as she continues to survive. No, they'd want you to survive. And that is exactly what we are going to do. This hints to Nami's own backstory and applies to the peace she is trying to make with herself about the things that she has done since her mother's death. The big battle between Luffy and Kuro wasn't that great in my opinion, as it felt like Kuro had a ton of opportunities to stab Luffy or at least slash his outstretched arm when he misses a gum gum pistol. There is one moment where instead of stabbing Luffy, Kuro gets close enough to whisper in his ear from behind. I guess you could argue that Kuro was taunting Luffy and didn't take him seriously, but it didn't really work for me. I found Zoro's fight with the henchmen to be more interesting. As a thanks for saving her, Kaya gives them the ship, which Luffy dubs the Going Merry, in honor of her deceased accountant. May he forever rest in cheap. Now moving on to Usopp's backstory. What backstory? I feel like Usopp kind of got short shrifted when it came to the flashbacks. He got like two scenes, one where he was warning the village about the pirates, and another where he watches his mom die. He easily has the least material to work with, and I can't help but wonder if there was nothing more to his backstory, or if this was all they were able to use. I'm sure the actor who played young Usopp did his best, but it was pretty rough to watch at times. We essentially learn that Usopp pulls his pirate prank to either trick himself or his mom that his dad is coming home, and so it's hard to feel anything when his mom dies. I also wasn't the biggest fan of Zoro's backstory. Firstly, I think its placement in the middle of Usopp's recruitment arc feels a bit odd. It's paired with Zoro's present day story beat of climbing out of the well, which was not that compelling. I feel like it would have been better used if it was in the episode where he fights me. Mihawk, as it would help to further illustrate why he is so adamant about fighting Mihawk and his unwillingness to back down. They do cut back to it a couple times throughout the fight, but that feels more like repeating material than adding new depth. The flashback itself is fine. The kid actors gave a mixed performance, and the story itself was relatively simple, with Zoro's friend dying and him having to fulfill their promise for the both of them. Overall, the Syrup Village storyline is probably where I have the most issues with the show, and I think it's the season's low point. Do you want me to quit. Is that what you want? Quit in this staying here! It's one thing to have a dream, it's another to go after it. For the next two sections, I'm going to start off by analyzing the flashback first. I think we get one of the best backstories of the show when we get to Sanji's. Just a wee eggplant, Sanji is a junior chef on a boat when the ship is attacked by pirates. His soup is about to be desecrated by oregano, and so he charges out to protect it. Here he meets Zeph, the captain of the invading pirates. As Sanji thinks he is about to be killed, he talks about his dream of finding the all blue. Turns out, Zeph has the same dream. Small world. But before they can bond over their shared dream, the ship is is destroyed by a storm, with Sanji and Zef being the only survivors. Zef was the first to wake, so he had dibs on the food, keeping the larger bag for himself and sending Sanji off to the other side of the mushroom rock that they are stranded on with the smaller bag. Zef tells Sanji not to bother him for any reason other than rescue. We then stay on Sanji's perspective as he waits for a ship to come and save them. It's a pretty great sequence as we see the toll being stranded takes on Sanji, forced to endure the elements, coming to the end of his ration and having a near miss with the ship 
We get to see Sanji slowly fall to his lowest point. When he finally does run out of food, he becomes desperate and angry over how it was unfair that Zeph got to have so much more food than he did. He grabs his knife and heads to the other side of the island to get some of Zeph's food, willing to fight for it if he has to. When he reaches the other side, he doesn't find what he's expecting. Zeph looks even rougher than Sanji does, and puts up no fight as Sanji moves to take some of his food. When Sanji cuts open the bag, instead of delicious yummy yummy food, he finds treasure, utterly useless. He's confused. Where's all the food? How could Zeph still be alive if he didn't have any food? That's when we get the reveal that Zeph gave Sanji all the food, using the treasure as a facade. With no food, Zeph was forced to the edge, and in his desperation, ate his own leg. I'd actually kind of expected that this is where the story was going, but even having my suspicions, the reveal is really powerful. Sanji doesn't understand why Zeph would do this for him when they are basically strangers. Zeph tells him that they share the same dream. And even though Zeph wasn't able to find the All Blue, maybe Sanji will be able to. He says that Sanji has to live on for the both of them, so that their dream can come true. And I'm gonna need you to fulfill that dream. The both of us. I think this scene is greatly acted by both performers, and helps to further inform Sanji's character in the present day. I do wonder though, how many days in do you think Zef ate his leg? Did he have absolutely no patience, and the second Sanji went to the other side, he just chopped that sucker off and went to town? Sanji stays working with Zef at Baratier, partly out of a sense of obligation. He feels indebted to him for saving his life, and feels like if he leaves, he will be abandoning Zef. His harrowing experience also led him to never refuse anyone Food, because he knows what it feels like to be starving. What do you think you're doing? A baratier everyone eats. And if there's anything that he can do to prevent someone from having to experience that pain, he's going to do it. This is a great flashback, because it in itself is an interesting story, as well as feeding back into Sanji's character. I think the fact that we stay in this flashback the entire time, without cutting back to the present day, also helps it out, as it allows the audience to really get immersed in the scenario. Almost as a transitional sequence from the Syrup Village arc to Baratier, we get to see the marines in hot pursuit of the Straw Hats. It comes with an initial reveal that Garp is in fact Luffy's grandpa, which is not something I saw coming. I think it does a good job though of retroactively explaining why such a high ranking admiral of the marines is so focused on hunting down this small band of no name pirates. It's essentially Garp trying to bring his grandson back to his side, as he sees Luffy's desire to be a pirate as something that will only lead to trouble. He thinks Luffy is on the wrong path and is trying to correct course. Garp talks to Luffy through a snail megaphone. Not much to say on this, other than to point out that they have snail megaphones. No doubt another snail subspecies. It's also really fun to see how inexperienced the Straw Hats are when it comes to seafaring. The only person who looks like they have any idea what they are doing is Nami, while the others are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. There's a lot for them to learn when it comes to sailing, and I am excited to see how far they will eventually grow in this respect. Nami, trim the, the sail thing. You know what a load of cannon, right? Yeah, of course, I loaded thousands of them. Uh, this must be a different model than I'm used to. Which way is for? We also get one of our first classic piratisms when Usopp tells the rest of the crew to hit the deck. Hit the with the seal officially broken, expect a few more piratisms to be crossed off. As the Straw Hats are being overwhelmed by the attack, and are unable to figure out how to fire the cannon, Luffy blows himself up, allowing him to fling the cannonball back at Garp. It's also worth noting that the cannonball in question was actually thrown by Garp, who clearly is a former shot put champion. The resulting destruction gives Garp a case of the giggles as he watches the Straw Hats escape. Following Luffy's nose, the Straw Hats come upon a restaurant in the middle of the sea called Baratie. I just have to say that even though all the sets have been fantastic to this point, I think Baratie might be my favorite location from a visual standpoint. As the crew tries to get a table, we get to see again how Luffy and Usopp are naive to the world. They don't have a reservation, but just think things will work out, and that Usopp's little speed managed to get them a table. The reality is that Nami, who is more experienced in the way of the world, paid the waiter to get them a table. Luffy further makes himself look like a child, as he jumps down the final few stairs, and when he needs to scoot into the booth, he crawls around it on all fours. These little details do a good job to show that Luffy is really just a big kid. We get to see a little behind the scenes, as we are treated to a DIY true bluefin sorte cooking recipe, courtesy of Sanji. We get some good initial character 
authorization for Sanji. As it turns out, he's kind of gone rogue preparing this, as opposed to the prime rib medium rare, which I assume was what the customer actually ordered. But this disagreement with head chef Zeff shows what each of them values in the moment. Zeff is all business, cooking for a more practical means, where Sanji is looking to express himself through his cooking, feeling that his creativity is being stifled by the way the baratier is currently being run. And the day that Baratier serves a dish like that little leg plant is the day that hell freezes over. I gotta sling one more prime rib medium while I am going to drop dead of boredom. I think it also hints that Sanji has outgrown the Baratier and yearns for something more. I think Zeph knows this too, and as a result, he tries to push Sanji to take the next step, but making his life here more difficult. He takes him off the line and sends him out to wait tables. He immediately comes across two patrons quarreling, something that is probably pretty common in a pirate restaurant. Sanji's initial instinct is to try and defuse the situation, but when it becomes clear that the two are determined to fight, he puts an end to it with his swift kicks of justice. However, Sanji's sour demeanor quickly sweetens once he takes the Straw Hat's order, and he comes across Nami. He instantly turns on the charm as he tries to schmooze Nami. And uh, the matter? Water. Still sparkling mineral with ice or without, cubed or crushed? Him listing every different variation of water available to them was a pretty fun moment. His character definitely comes across as a ladies man. After eating a delicious meal, Luffy pays Zeph with an IOU. That's as good as money, sir. Those are IOUs. Go ahead and add it up. Every cent's accounted for. Which isn't quite good enough for him. The IOU becomes doing a year's worth of dishes. Nami, Zoro, and Usopp don't have to do any dishes though, and they go buy some drinks. Why didn't they pay for Luffy? Mm. Usopp is having the time of his life, as he is dripped out, gets a big fun party drink, and is dancing like there's no tomorrow. On the down low, Nami is preparing to ditch the crew. As Luffy is doing dishes, he tries Sanji's discarded entree. The two then get into a conversation about what Sanji's dream is. He tells Luffy that that he wants to find the All Blue, which is a body of water said to contain all the fish species in the world. Luffy relates to Sanji about how he feels like a stubborn old man, is trying to dictate what he does. Don't let some stubborn old man get in the way of your dream. For Luffy, it's Scarp trying to turn him into a marine, and he thinks for Sanji, it's Zeph trying to stop him from cooking. As the two are talking, a haggard pirate comes in through the back door, begging for food. After Sanji feeds him, he tells them of a powerful pirate that destroyed his ship. Mihawk's introduction is a great scene, seeing how powerful one of the seven warlords of the sea is. After Luffy evaded Garp, Garp called up Mihawk to bring Luffy in. The revelation that the marines pardoned the seven most powerful pirates speaks to a bit of corruption in the marines, as they are happy to turn to blind eye so long as the warlords follow some protocols. It shows that not everyone is equal under the law, and that the marines are willing to let some people get away with far more than others. As Mihawk is looking for Luffy, he finds Zoro instead. As his dream is to become the greatest swordsman in the world, Zoro jumps at the chance to challenge Mihawk to a duel, as to be the best, you have to beat the best. Mihawk agrees, and the crew has varied reactions to the news. Nami is horrified. Knowing how strong Mihawk is, she begs Zoro to back out, as she thinks it spells certain death for him. Luffy, on the other hand, feels like he is in no place to stop Zoro, as telling him to stop would be akin to telling him to abandon his dream, something that Luffy would never do. And Usopp, well, Usopp is sloshed, and doesn't have many tangible thoughts at the time. With the lead up to the fight, Nami takes the map and prepares to leave like she planned, but when it comes down to it, she decides to stay and support Zoro. The fight with Mihawk is great for a number of reasons. The first great moment is when Mihawk whips out his baby sword, essentially telling Zoro how little he thinks of him. I don't hunt rabbits with a cannon. The difference in size between Mihawk's baby blade and his big blade is the difference in skill between Zoro and him. Also, I was absolutely not expecting this, and it got a good laugh from me. Watching the little sword in action was a little silly as it sent Zoro flying, but I think it was supposed to look a little funny. As Zoro proves himself to be unrelenting, even when his defeat is all but guaranteed. Mihawk grows some respect for him. He puts away the baby blade and brings out his big blade, giving Zoro the honor of fighting him with it. Finish him! 
Mihawk slashes Zoro across the chest, leaving the former pirate hunter soundly defeated. For a lot of the season, Zoro's character, despite being cool, has felt a little flat. His stoicism definitely gives his character a certain appeal, but I am glad that this moment allowed us to explore him a little more and see him in a vulnerable state. It was a nice change of pace seeing Zoro's post-fight breakdown, where he vows to never lose again. I think it worked well, and if anything, I would have liked the moment to be more emotional and to follow up on it a bit more throughout the rest of the season. However, I do have some issues with Zoro's almost death. They really try to sell the fact that Zoro is on the verge of death and is losing a ton of blood. He's losing so much blood. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you, he's lost a lot of blood. It might be too late for him. Where's he bleeding from? Everywhere. But there really isn't much blood to speak of, and the cut itself looks really clean and shallow, combined with the fact that Mihawk even told Zoro not to die. Rowano is Zoro. It's too soon for you to die. Grow strong and come find me. It seems clear that his intention wasn't to kill Zoro, and so I never really feared for Zoro's life. If anything, the show's insistence on Zoro almost dying almost took away from the moment. He is eventually treated for his wounds by Zaf, who uses an old seaman's trick and covers the wound with fish skin. This seemed odd to me, but apparently fish skin does have some healing properties, so the more you know I guess. For the first time, Luffy is feeling the responsibility of being captain. His crew has put their lives in his hands, and he has to do his best to look after them. He struggles with the idea that he could have stopped Zoro, and if he had, Zoro would not be in such poor condition. He anxiously polishes Zoro's sword, as he can't help but worry and feel somewhat responsible. When he goes to talk to Zoro later, so that Zoro can hear his voice and know that his friends are there for him, he struggles to think of anything to say. The Straw Hat's problems only increase as the Fish Boys arrive in town. The Fish Boys are a different race in the world of One Piece, with enhanced strength and durability compared to humans. They also taste like fish, but talk like people. The leader of the fish boys is Arlong, and he has come to Baratier looking to pick a fight with Luffy. It turns out that Buggy had left an ear in Luffy's hat, and that's how Arlong was able to find the Straw Hats. Luffy is all too happy to give Arlong the fight that he's looking for, and the two start to tango. It's a pretty entertaining fight, and gives Sanji a chance to show some of his moves in his first real fight. Despite his stretchiness, Luffy is clearly outmatched, and is only spared when Nami encourages Arlong to let the sea do the dirty work. Nami reveals that she is part of Arlong's pirate crew, and that she always planned on betraying them to bring the map to Arlong. We're finally getting answers to why Nami has been so cagey. I was never on your crew. I only joined up with you so I could steal the map. Arlong takes Nami's advice and they leave, only for Sanji to dive in and save the Loofster. When Sanji starts cleaning up the damage from the fight, Zeph yells at him, trying to push him away so that he will go and fulfill their dream of finding the All Blue. Angrily, Sanji listens to Zeph and asks Luffy if he can join the crew, which Luffy is all too happy to accept. As the Going Merry sets sail to find Nami, Sanji and Zeph share a final goodbye. It's a heartfelt moment as Sanji thanks Zeph for saving his life, taking him under his wing and putting up with him for all these years. I owe you my life. Thank you for putting up with my shit all these years, old man. It is one of the season's most emotional moments, and I think both actors nail it. The relationship between Sanji and Zeph is one of the strongest through lines of the entire Baratie arc. Welcome to Arlong Park. Throughout the season, Nami was a character shrouded in mystery. We never had the full story as to what she was doing, and it was clear she had some baggage. After Nami's betrayal, we finally get to learn why Nami is the way she is. I think the fact that Nami's past is hinted at throughout the season adds to the strength of her backstory. It was the flashback that I was most anticipating, because it felt like it was the missing piece of the puzzle. It turns out, Nami grew up on a tangerine farm, on the outskirts of a small village with her mother and sister. By getting some flashbackception and going into a flashback within our flashback, we learn that Nami was actually orphaned during a battle and was found by Belmare in its aftermath. Just as Belmare is not her biological mother, her sister, Nojiko, is not her biological sister, and the family was born out of the three not having anyone else. As a child, Nami is incredibly bright and wants to study the maps of the world. However, as her family is extremely poor, they can't afford 
to buy these books, and so Nami resorts to stealing them. Even though Belmare clearly cares for her adopted daughters, she's not always the best at dealing with them, as when Nami lashes out, as a child is wont to do, Belmare strikes her. The two reconceal, but this shows us that even before things go south, Nami and her family are having a difficult time. Nami returns the stolen book, and promises to never steal again. And before this lesson can fully sink in, Coco Village's Usopp equivalent warns them that the pirates are coming. Arlong and the fish boys burst into the town, destroying it and making the citizenry pay them a tribute. Nami and her mom run back to their home, where Belle Mare tries to hide Nami and her sister under the floorboards. When Arlong's crew come a knockin', they are seemingly in the clear, as there is no official record of Belmare ever having children. However, before leaving, Arlong spots three places set for dinner, and Belmare comes clean. I have two daughters. When the jig is up, Nami and Nojiko come running up the stairs. Nami asks her mother why she didn't just lie, as she could have said she had company over or something. Belmare tells her that she wouldn't lie about not having children, because they are her daughters no matter what. She ends up using the tribute money to pay for Nami and Nojiko, and without enough to pay for herself, Arlong has her killed. This is a formative event for Nami in a number of ways. Firstly, I think she has difficulty figuring out why her mom didn't just lie, as in her mind, if she she had, she might still be alive. Why didn't you just lie? You didn't have to tell him about it. I feel like this almost creates an association for Nami that lying can be used as a defense mechanism and can save lives. For Nami, telling the truth is something that is dangerous and can hurt those around her. I think this is part of the reason that Nami doesn't tell anyone about her plan to buy back the town, because if she told them, she feels like she would be putting them in more danger. After the death of her mother and Arlong ruling over Coco Village, Nami decides to take the fate of the town into her own hands, showing Nami to be a proactive character, she approaches Arlong to join his crew, offering something he wants, her map drawing ability, for something she wants, the freedom of her village. Arlong agrees to sell Coco Village to her for a hundred million berry, and Nami believes he will stay true to his word. Nami dedicates her entire life to freeing the village, and is willing to endure whatever torments she must in order to achieve her goal. She takes her dream of drawing a map of the world and twists it to make herself useful to Arlong. She lies and steals trying to save up enough so that she can buy everyone's freedom. In order to try and save the people of her village, she corrupts parts of herself, shouldering the burden of the entire town and doing so in complete isolation. To not endanger the villagers, she lies to them as to why she joined Arlong's crew, and as a result, the very people she is trying to save grow to loathe her. I feel like Nami's backstory does so much to flesh out her character and explain her actions in the main storyline. It also further fleshes out the dynamic she has with Arlong, it makes the audience much more personally invested in seeing him brought to justice. This is probably my favorite backstory, as I feel it does a ton to make the Arlong Park storyline more impactful, while adding depth to Nami's character. If I were to give the flashbacks a power ranking from best to worst, it would be best Nami, then Sanji, Luffy, Zoro, and then last Usopp. In the present day, we follow the Straw Hats on their quest to find Nami. Their guide is the best boy Buggy, who is currently a disembodied head. Once again, and proving that his devil fruit abilities are a curse. He is able to guide the Straw Hats to Arlong Park, because that's where his body is and it is calling to him. His current predicament does beg the question though, about whether or not Buggy is immortal. Can he survive without food and water? Because at the moment he has no stomach and digestive system, there's really nowhere for anything he consumes to go. Do you think of how long it's been since I've had any smoked fish? Maybe. If you guys had some extra? Can you feel his stomach's hunger even though he is not physically connected to it? We may never know the answers to these questions, and perhaps it's better that way. Buggy himself continues to be a delight, as he and Zoro get into a little altercation, with Buggy's reaction being priceless. Zoro, buddy! Uttermont's pirates, right? We also see the Straw Hats trying to come to grips with Nami's betrayal. Zoro is quick to discount her, saying that she was never part of their crew, and that by leaving with Arlong, she has already made her decision. Sanji doesn't believe that Nami would choose to align herself with someone like Arlong, and that there must be an explanation for her behavior. He thinks that she is clearly in some trouble and needs their help. Luffy is concerned with Nami's safety, just wanting to make sure that she is okay. As they reach their destination, Usopp delivers the show's second piratism. Land ho! 
On the Nami side of things, Arlong has called her into his office. Nami had been gone for some time, and Arlong even suggests that he wondered if she was going to come back. He tells her that in the new world he is going to create, Nami will have a special place by his side. In order to show Nami that he is still the boss, and that she is entirely powerless to go against him, he sends her to go collect the tribute from Coco Village. It's his way of taunting her, making her essentially rob her own hometown. When she goes to collect, Coco Village is short. Now, I could be wrong here, but I feel like Nami might have paid the difference. When Arlong goes to pay off the Marines later, neither he nor Mouse Boy seem to question that the amount is less than usual. I think Nami might have paid the difference to avoid Coco Village from getting into any trouble. Just as she is collecting the tribute, Luffy and the crew stroll into town, and Nami tells them to leave. Nami is telling them to leave for a few reasons. I think she sees the Straw Hat's presence there as a complication, and she doesn't want to put them in jeopardy. Also, in her mind, she has the money to buy Coco Village, and so she doesn't want anything to ruin that. If Arlong finds the Straw Hats in Coco Village, he might think that Nami betrayed him, giving him a reason to back out of their deal. Nami is not willing to risk everything that she's been working for. The Straw Hats leave to go talk to Nami's sister, where they hear about her backstory. I bring this up mostly to mention that Usopp is the best hype man. He's the best cook in the East Blue. You never tasted anything better in your life. Usopp's word. The Marine who Arlong has been paying off in order to look the other way has decided to alter their deal, asking for more money. I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. This deal's getting worse all the time. Also, he is dressed like a mouse. In the Marines, once you reach the rank of captain, do you just get to pick out a fursona? After Mouse Boy puts his foot in his mouth, Arlong alters the deal. I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. But there's still a chance for Mouse Boy to make some money once Nami announces to Arlong that she has all the money to buy back Coco Village. I think Nami is a little naive to Arlong keeping his word, which makes sense in my opinion. Throughout most of the season, Nami has been the character that is most in tune with how the real world works. Knowing that things don't just always work out for you, and that you have to actively make decisions to lead to your desired outcome. However, in this instance, she believes that Arlong, who has proven himself to be the worst sort of pirate, lying, thieving, murdering, will uphold his end of the deal. Not to mention how important Nami has become to his operation throughout all these years, and how he would likely loathe to part ways with her services. But I think because she almost has to believe that Arlong will honor his word, because everything she has worked for, her only source of hope to free herself and her home from under his foot is dependent on it. If she doubts him, then all her work was for nothing, and that her life will continue to be a living hell. She has to believe Arlong because it's her only hope of escape. For Arlong's part, by sending Mouse Boy to take the money in the name of the law, Arlong can still claim to be a fishman of his word, on a technicality. He would claim that he would have kept his word if she brought the money to him, even though he had no intention of ever letting that happen. When Nami does go to dig up her treasure, Mouse Boy comes upon her, slipping up as he unintentionally reveals that Arlong was behind the confiscation. A hundred million berry? And where would you get that much money? How did you know it was a hundred? Arlong put you up to this. Nami's screams are heart-wrenching as she sees everything she worked for being taken away. It really feels like she is having a panic attack, completely overwhelmed by emotions as Arlong's betrayal sinks in and she realizes that everything she has done, every time she gave a bit of herself away by drawing him maps or stealing from others, all of it was meaningless and that the living hell that has been her existence has no end in sight. It's an incredibly powerful moment, and I think Nami's actress, Emily Rudd, absolutely kills it. This scene leads into another fantastic scene, as Nami runs only to see that Arlong has attacked Coco Village. Nami is consumed with despair, frustration, and anger. There's nothing she can do, and all of her emotions need an outlet. As she sees the tattoo on her arm, showing that Arlong has marked her as his property, she fully breaks down, stabbing her arm as she calls out Arlong's name. <laughs> And then... Luffy catches her hand. Luffy has been waiting until he was needed, and with Nami at her lowest point, she quietly asks him for his help. Help me. 
<laughs> in a greatly symbolic move, he puts his hat on her, almost as if he is taking her under his protection and into his family. The entire scene is a treat to watch, and I can understand why so many people have cited this as the moment they fell in love with One Piece. As Luffy gets ready to confront Arlong, we get a sick shot of the crew, who are just waiting for the word to head out. After all that praise, I will take the time here to point out a small issue I have. We see them marching in the night to go fight Arlong and stop the destruction of Coco Village, only for when they finally arrive, it to look like it's midday and Arlong is long gone. I don't know, it didn't feel like it should have taken them that long to get over there, so this just feels like a consistency issue. The final battle was pretty entertaining with some high points. Both Zoro and Sanji have some really cool moments, and I really find myself enjoying their fighting styles. There seems to be a Legolas Gimli dynamic forming between the two, as they are constantly trying to one-up each other in battle. Maybe you should take a break. Maybe you ought to get back in the kitchen. My only complaint on their side of things is that it almost felt too easy. They were just cleaning up these no-name fish boys, so there wasn't really much tension. They free Buggy, reuniting him with his body, in the hopes that he will help them, only for him to flip them off and run away. What a scamp. When one of the fish boys insults Nami, Sanji activates his super simp mode and really kicks it into high gear. In the main event of the climax, Luffy vs Arlong, we get a decently entertaining bout. It starts out with some back and forth, as they discuss how they view Nami. Arlong sees her as a tool for him to use in order to achieve his goals, whereas Luffy sees her as the multifaceted person that she is. This is also when I realize that Arlong sometimes sounds like he is doing a Christopher Walken impression. I'm just kidding. Started, darling. During the fight, Luffy punches Arlong in the mouth, and his teeth all start to fall out. I'm pretty sure I've had that nightmare before. As the fight goes on, it becomes clear Luffy is still outmatched, and so he resolves to winning the fight in a different way, destroying all of the maps that Arlong got Nami to make. In the process of destroying the maps, he ends up destroying the entire building, which crushes both Luffy and Arlong. But apparently Luffy is invincible, because he walks away from the disaster? No problem. I think this was a great climax to the storyline, but I would have liked to have had Nami a bit more involved in the actual resolution. Most of the emotional investment in this story is through Nami, and when it comes to actually fighting the fish boys, she's just standing off to the side. After Arlong is defeated, Garp and the Marines come to rain on the crew's Endor party. I really don't care for this little fight between Luffy and Garp, because it feels like such an afterthought, especially after the highs of Arlong Park. When the Straw Hats leave Coco Village and set sail, we do get a pretty cool scene when once Luffy gives us another piratism. All hands on deck for a cast off ceremony! The Straw Hats all renew their dreams as they put their foot on a barrel, re establishing their commitment to see these become a reality with the help of their friends. Luffy vows to become the king of the pirates. Sanji vows to find the all blue. Zoro vows to be the greatest swordsman in the world. Nami vows to draw a map of the world. And Usopp. What's this upstream again? Oh, to be a brave warrior, apparently. I must have missed that somewhere during the Syrup Village storyline. <laughs> Most people expected Netflix's live-action One Piece adaptation to be an abject failure. However, they managed to prove everyone wrong, as a dedicated cast and crew worked tirelessly alongside the guidance of the world's creator, Ichiro Oda, to bring what many deemed to be an unadaptable story to life. It's clear how passionate everyone involved in this project was, and it's hard not to root for their continued success. In many ways, the conditions that brought the show to life were a perfect storm, and had a few small things been different, the end result could have been far worse. One Piece was an incredibly fun ride from start to finish, and even though it is not a perfect show, it managed to nail what it was going for. The tone and atmosphere created by the show helped to blend the silly ridiculous aspects of the world with an emotional grounding. If I were to give it a rating out of 10, I would give it a high 7. Also, I think it's fair to say that this show exposed One Piece to a demographic of people who might not have experienced the story otherwise, and now now, they might be interested enough in this world to start the manga or anime. With season 2 already confirmed, I'm sure that more incredible moments are yet to come. I will say one thing though, and that is that I hope that Netflix doesn't learn the wrong lesson from the show's success. 
Similar to how after the massive success of Barbie, Mattel started to talk about a Mattel Cinematic Universe. I don't think Netflix should just be greenlighting a bunch of anime live action adaptations. There seems to be the strange idea that live action is the top dog when it comes to visual mediums, and that they are somehow superior to animated stories. In my opinion, some stories simply lend themselves better to the medium of animation, whereas other stories are better suited in live action. I don't think every animated story needs a live action adaptation, and doing so can often lead to the flanderization of interesting stories. I love anime. Not every great anime needs to be made into live action. I think I might be rambling a bit at the end here, but essentially, my point is that any future live action anime adaptations are being adapted because the people behind them are passionate about it, and that there is a reason why they are doing it. But I guess we will just have to wait and see. I really didn't expect to talk this much about One Piece, but once it got going, it was hard to stop. If you somehow made it to the end of this video, I want to thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. It really helps out the channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.